I like little, I like little icons, and our icon of the uh, the domestic pigs here reminds us that this field of quantitative genetics has been field tested with not only animal strains that have been improved, as the breeders say, but also a lot of plants. This is why we have the beautiful corn that we have today. Whether people were using the theory or not, a lot of the principles were used to Im improve our, our domestic strains of plants and animals, maybe even yeast, huh? But in any case, uh, the concepts in the plant and animal breeding literature trace back to our, our guy, Jay Lush, who is working directly with, with Wright and Sewell, Sewell Wright and Ronald Fisher's results. So, and I'll try and give you uh, some, uh, some um, um, here's the Twitter feed, give you some uh, Jay Lush terminology. Maybe Pat can help too. We all like Jay Lush, don't we? All right. We told, uh, we told the guy back at Nessent that we were going to, when we went to Nimbus, or Nimbus, we were going to, Joe and I were going to emulate the click and clack program. You know, that's our sort of model here. All right, so a lot of complication in, you know, inter the introductory quantitative genetics, but there are only three main lessons that we want to take, not only from my lecture, but from Joe's as well. And the first is that most traits are affected by many genes, and that's why we're interested in quantitative genetics. Uh, you have to really look for traits that are only affected by a single locus. You look around at all of us, the things that we differ in are there are differences, phenotypic differences in many genes. Uh, when you've got many genes, when you, have, when you endorse po polygeny, you need a statistical approach, and that's the big lesson today, that you can tackle the, all of these complexities with models and, and statistics. And then the third idea is that what bubbles up out of all of, the, all of the Fisherian algebra is a single important copy concept, additive genetic variance. Dominance variance might be important in some situations. Epistatic variance might be important in, important in, in some situations. But additive genetic variance is always important when we look in evolutionary problems in quantitative genetics. And so we need to understand it. And we need, to, we need to estimate it, and uh, that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of today. Okay, so that, that's our thesis. Here's what we're going to do in the talk quickly. Uh, we're going to go back and talk about phenotypic resemblance between parents and offspring and why that reveals heritable variation. And we'll see why we want to look particularly at that relationship. Uh, to understand resemblance, we need a model. Uh, there's a, a model derived from the underlying model of genetic effects that Joe was talking about. We're going to look at that. I'll provide you with some examples. Uh, we're going we're to worry now. Because here, we're going to worry about why we don't run out of additive genetic variance. And there's a simple reason we don't. But uh, in particular, we want to go to an evolutionary time dimension, not just from one generation to the next. And so as we go forward, if we're, as Jay Lush used to say, if selection is nibbling away at genetic variation each generation, why doesn't it get nibbled away to nothing? So we want to worry about that. And then finally, we want to worry about improving our animal breeds or plant, plant strains. And we want to do that by selection, truncation, or some other mode. Or we want to wonder how directional selection in nature is going to change the mean of the population. And guess what is going to be the key concept for doing that? Additive genetic variance and also the selection differential. Okay, so, so very simple messages, but there's, uh, they come out of a little bit of history and they come out of a little bit of algebra. And we don't have time to do derivations in this class, but we're going to show you the... Uh, we're going to show you an overview, and you can dive into Bruce Weir's notes. You can dive into the text that we're refer uh, pointing you towards, and you can get all the details later if you want. Let's go back to Galton, uh, Charles Darwin's uh, first cousin. Uh, interested in natural inheritance, as he called it. And what I've done here is I've taken Galton's data on stature in human populations, and I've graphed it in our way offspring as a function of parents. Now, uh, this is the British population in what? About 18, in the, in the last 20 years of the 19th century. 
And what do each of these points represent? Well, this is, and this is a graphical approach that I think really put the whole field of quantitative genetics headed in a particular direction. You've got two parents and you've got a lot of offspring, right? How do you graphically portray resemblance between parents and offspring? And, and so what Francis Galton did was invent the concept of the average of the two parents. And he called it the mid-parents. You just take the average of mom and dad. You forget about sexual dimorphism. We can deal with that, but it's not in here. So if we look at this po point, that is a pair of parents whose average height was about 66 inches. And if we go over to this axis, that value is the average height of their parents, of, sorry, of their offspring. Whatever, and we're going to call that mid-offspring, sometimes it's called. And what Galton, now there's so many data in this point, it's not so obvious, but there is a regression line going through the, the points. And while, uh, I'm not going to, we're a little bit short of time, not, I'm not, well, I guess I can do it. There's a tendency of offspring to be on this line, right? It's the best fit line. And so if you see, what you can see is, if you're above average parents, if, if, if the parents are above average, the offspring are regressing to this, to this line. They're regressing above the mean. But if you've got offspring, if you've got offspring, sorry, if you've got offspring out, if you've got parents here that are below the average, their offspring are regressing upwards towards the mean, and the offspring of exceptionally larger parents are regressing downward towards the mean. And that's why we, it, the, the, the line is called the regression line. It's not the line of perfect inheritance, which is this one right here, the dotted line. So our con the very term regression comes from this, from this plot. Okay, so in Galton's time, and we're, we're thinking back to 1889, this is as far as it went, right? This is, this is the expression of Galton's law of ancestral inheritance. No algebra, no model, just a simple graphical summary. But we can take this approach and we can... We can look at musical ability, we could look at mathematical ability, we could look at back fat in swine, anything we want, and we can measure the, the, the extent of resemblance between relatives, and we're going to do that with the slope of the line. And it's just a simple, in Galton's hands, it's a simple empirical generalization that works in many formats. And so Fisher, Weinberg, and Wright, the genius of those three guys, was to independently say, what are the... Mendelian roots for this phenomenon? And the answer to that is, in all three independent derivations, why independent? World War I. So in the US, in Germany, and in England, three guys are independently deriving basically the same algebra with different, relaxing different assumptions. And, and what comes out of all three is that the simple point that we're getting at today, the key feature responsible for the regression line is additive genetic variance. Very simple result. And so we, we're keenly interested. We're trying to show you that result, but we're not going to take you through all the algebra. Here's, here's Joe's model. And now I'm going to show you the change in, uh, the change in uh, notation. So this is the, the pentalocus version of the model, right? Here are three, five loci, one, two, th I guess it's four. No, this is the fifth. He confuses me because it's E, and I always look at it quickly. Here's an, the environmental effect, but they're five loci. It's the simplest versions with two alleles at each locus, but we can have as many loci as we want, and in each of these little brackets, we could have as many alleles as we want, as many geni and hence as many genotypes as we want. So it's completely general in that way. Uh, but in the version we're looking at here, although there's dominance, there's no, there's no epistasis, right? All right, so in the notation we're going to look at today, what we're going to do is we're going to, from this genotypic model, this model of contributions, we're going to take the, at, well, if we've got dominance, so we have to use Fisher's little technique or something analogous, and we have to tease out the additive genetic effects f at each locus. And I could flip back and you could find them. I can't remember your notation where those were our alphas, weren't they? 
and we could calculate the alpha, we could calculate, it's actually the, the sum of alphas at a, at a, the alpha subscripts are the effects of particular alleles, but there's a linear combination of those effects that represents the additive contribution at that locus to the phenotypic value. You with me? Okay, you can go back and look at that. And we're gonna call, we're gonna call that in Joe's notation P, but I'm gonna call it little z. We're saying goodbye to the Fisherian. what's the adjective for falcon? Falcon-esque notation, and we're going to do this notation. This x represents the sum of additive effects across all loci. And this E represents the contribution, uh, the summed, summed environmental effects across all, uh, across all loci. You with me? Very simple thing. So now we've got, and just as the individual contributions are independent, so are the uncorrelated, so are the sums. And so if we take the mean phenotypic value in the population, that's just the, the mean of the, uh, of the sum of additive effects and the sum of the environmental effects. Let me just stop, let's do a little J. Lush thing here. Um, it's, this seems cavalier to just sum across all the additive effects at all the loci, but not only can we measure these things down here, the additive genetic variance, which we're gonna call G, the environmental variance, E, and the phenotypic variance, we can measure those. We can actually measure this by observation on an individual, right? I can get the height of your ear. Um, now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna depart from the human example here. Suppose we were looking at, we were looking at milk yield in cows. We can measure milk yield, and now we want to know the milk yield for an individual, whether it's a female or a male. How would we do that? This is, this is, this is part of the heritage from Jay Lush, and actually Ronald Fisher as well. We can go out into the population, and we can breed an individual to, as let's say we're going to estimate the milk yield additive genetic value, the breeding value for a, 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 a bull. We breed that bull to a huge sample of dams, female cows. We produce female progeny. We measure their milk yields. We take the average of all their milk yields, and that will give an, us an estimate of that bull's breeding value, the, some, some of his additive effects across all loci. And I think that's huge. It's also the foundation for the uh, uh, AI industry, the artificial insemination industry, right? Because if you're a cattle breeder, or whether you're, whether you're, you're selling your, your sperm for the milk yields in the, in the females that it will produce, or the steaks that it will produce, you produce, ca you produce a brochure and you actually list, with standard errors and everything, the, the breeding values of each of your prime bulls for any traits that you're trying to market. Are you with me? So it's completely, completely applicable. So once you sum across the allele, so it seems like a crazy thing to do, but when you look at the phenotypic variance of a trait, we've decomposed it into an additive genetic value and into a uh, 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 additive genetic variance and an environmental variance. Okay, we can measure this, but by doing a breeding design, we can also estimate these two things. Now, we've done that by, in part, by also sweeping uh, dominus deviations and uh, epistatic deviations into the E term, into the environmental term, right? And so we'll see why we, why we would do that. And now, now I just introduced you to Landy notation. Okay, so here we're going to get a new perspective on Galton's regression. This is the same expression that Joe gave you before. Let me write another thing on the board. So Joe said you said to run out and do this, but we can do it very quickly here. If we look at the, um, let me just do this for you. If we look at the correlation between offspring and parents, that's equal to cove OP, like that. Divided we, by um, can we get any overhead lights here? Does that show up online? 
is um, Eric. I could do it. There's a light right here. Anyway, I'll just do this. Var O Var P. That this is parent. This is offspring. You with me? So if you don't remember, you're familiar with just standard product moment correlations, right? It's the ratio of the covariance of the traits to the, the square root of the product of the variances. And the regression we were talking about is this. You can't do this so well in your notes. The slope of the regression is that. All right. I'm not going to write out the expressions for variance, but the covariance is the same expression as for a variance, except you've got the, you've got the variable in question. You've got a cross product instead of a, a square deviation term. All right. So when... When, when f what I meant to point out is the slope of the line when we do the, the mid-offspring regressed on mid-parent, the slope of that line is h squared. We've combined the parents and we've taken the, the average of the offspring. What is that slope, the thing Galton had called heritability? Well, in terms of our new notation, it's the covariance of mid-offspring values with mid-parent values. And it's a regression, so there's a covariance. And here I've written the, the denominator of the regression term as p minus 1, where p is the variance of parents, right? Parent values. Did I do it right over here? S yes, but sloppily. Like that. All right. So, um, and by the argument actually that Joe presented earlier, uh, on one, uh, because of one of our uncorrelated assumptions, the environmental values of parents and offspring should not be correlated. So that term drops out when we decompose this, and we're left with the covariance between breeding values, the sum of additive genetic values, right? And so this term is, is actually the, sur the covariance of the same random variable in two different generations. So we're going to call that additive genetic variance. And uh, we could write it this way. We're going to call this additive genetic variance and this the phenotypic variance of the trait. And I've taken pains to write it this way for a particular reason, and that's because when we go to multiple traits, this is going to be the matrix formulation for, uh, for heritability, if you like. Uh, except we're not going to use it actually in that form, but you'll, you'll see that pair of terms in equations we present later on. Okay, so the, but our point is, back in way, the main point is that the model, when we collect terms across loci, identifies G, additive genetic variance, as the key, the key genetic concept underlying Galton's results. And with a lot of tedious algebra, we could see how all of the contributions from individual loci can contribute to that, that concept of additive genetic variance. Okay, so that's parents and offspring. Uh, what about other kinds of relatives? And what I'm going to do here is, if you look down below in, in, the, in the PowerPoint, is I'm going to show you a result due to uh, Cockerham, uh, who was a student at Iowa State. I, I suppose, was Cockerham Lush's student? I thought he would slip, but he's... Yeah, I don't know offhand, but I think it's quite likely. I mean, they certainly... In any case, yeah. Cockerham, he, he, co this, Cockerham in, in this country in the, in the 50s, and Oscar Kempthorne, who was Fisher's student in England, independently expanded Fisher's model and added in the possibility of epistasis. And when they, so I'm going to show you, uh, so if you look at, so now I'm going to show you the general relationship, this one, in, this due to Cockerham, but Kempthorne showed the same thing. Adding in epistasis is ra uh, in addition to dominance. So here, what is, what is D? 
D is the sum of those little lowercase deltas that Joe was showing. If you got dominance deviations from that regression line at each locus, you could, just to get rid of all, if you, imagine you've got 100, 100 loci, right? You've got this ex expression is huge. Now, Joe collected terms for you, and I'm not doing it literally here, but I'm just telling you that this is the sum of additive effects across all loci. D is the sum of dominance deviations, and epistasis is the sum of deviations from additive effects and dominant effects due to epistasis summed across all of the loci. And what Cockerham did in it, sorry, yeah, Cockerham did in addition, he's collected, he did a sub-collection of terms, so this, is, this sum of terms can be decomposed in the sum of uh, pairwise interactions between additive effects summed across all loci, sum of all interactions, pairwise interactions between additive and dominance effects at, at each locus summed across. Anyway, so you can decompose. You can imagine, imagine the, the enthusiasm which, with which his doctoral committee must have uh, greeted the, f the volumes of pages the, of notes you know, that led to this proof of that relationship. But it's straightforward because of all of the, uh, uh, all of the uncorrelated uh, relationships that were built in. So what we're heading to now is Cockerham's expression for the, a general expression for the covariance between two relatives, x and y, relaxing the assumption of, of no epistasis. Now, of course, I've changed notation on you. I didn't mean to. So now to con connect this up to the earlier literature, earlier lecture, what Joe called F1 is here R, coefficient of relationship, and F2, U, in the not notation here, named something by Falconer, which we will look up, won't we? And here's, here's his, here's, here's his uh, general expression. So what, we, what you need to do for each pair of relatives here is say what kind are they, parent and offspring, full sibs or whatever, and you can easily by just pedigree analysis, figure out what R and U are for each pair of relatives. And then you can, you, can, you can convert this general formula into the result for particular, particular pairs of relatives. Now, we're going to focus, for a reason we'll just see in a minute, on the parent-offspring regression. We're going to focus on that relationship because by regression argument, that's the relationship that takes selection in this generation into an effect in the next generation. And from that standpoint, from the standpoint of evolutionary biologists, it is the most important quantitative genetic relationship, the parent-offspring relationship. So if you look at parents and offspring for a minute, in that case, R is one-half, and U is zero. So you lose this term. Dominance deviations don't p play any role in the resemblance in between parents and offspring. But look, R squared, one-half squared is one-quarter. So there is a contribution by, from additive, by additive effects. This term is zero because the u is zero. This term is zero. This term is there. R cubed is now what? Is it one-eighth? It yeah, it is. And so it's one-eighth of the genetic contribution of all the sum pairwise. At any rate, in the, in the text uh, that accompanies in the chapter that that gives this expression that I've given you, there's a general argument, which is common in the literature, that because of this power series in R, there's a diminishing, probably a diminishing contribution of these terms, uh, you know, assuming that this isn't large enough to compensate for the fact that we're raising a fraction to a power, right? So the general argument is that probably you could get away with, with just this first term, for parents and offspring, and maybe just for these first two terms. So in other words, when you look at the regression of mid-offspring mid on mid-parents, you're actually looking at not just the contribution of G, but also the contribution of this first epistatic term, which we think is probably smaller than this, but we don't know. The general, the general, uh, the general feeling in the field, I think, is that when you're doing quantitative genetics, this is probably an adequate interpretation 
of the regression of, of offspring on parents. But there are those in the room, at least three of us, who are entertain the possibility that this term might be important here and in a variety of other contexts. And in general, that epistasis shouldn't be ignored. So there's a controversy that rages in the field. There's one group that says, on a statistical argument, it's probably not important. There's another group that says, you know, we're seeing epistasis in every quantitative, uh, every QTL study that's ever been done. So maybe we should be paying attention to it. And uh, there are even proposals that are being reviewed right now to uh, fund research to try and decide between the two sides of that controversy. Could, could I just add that um, the covariance term there, because, for example, additive by additive has R squared and additive by additive, by additive has R cubed, that means that those variance components make a diminishing contribution as you go up to the higher order ones, and they become increasingly hard to estimate. Hard to estimate and probably smaller and smaller as you go up. Yeah, so um, there are those who just say, uh, don't bother, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be too hard, you'll get too noisy an estimate, and it won't really tell you anything. So um, you, you will You're, find people who, who, who go in that direction. We're at the Center for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis, so, and you know this better than me, but aren't we looking like at something like a Taylor series here? And so what we're doing is we're just taking, might take the first term in a Taylor series and, and imagine that the higher order terms are, are small. So it, to assume that, that probably that's a good interpretation of, of, of the covariance and maybe at most the first two terms, that, that's a standard, standard kind of argument. It's nothing, nothing outrageous about that. Okay, so, uh, but a simple result is the resemblance between uh, Parents, so here's the, here's the bottom line, that resemblance between parents and offspring, which is important to us, is probably primarily due to additive genetic variants, with maybe a little jigger of epistasis. But it certainly has nothing to do with dominance deviations. So from the standpoint, standpoint of evolutionary quantitative genetics, the field says lovely result, RA for accounting for dominance deviations, but in any case, they're not really important to us. You could estimate them for some other reason, but they're, they seem not to be important for the usual kinds of evolutionary questions we would ask. Okay, a few examples. Uh, this is a bridge to our, our computer exercise today in which we're going to look at, we're going to actually estimate heritability uh, of, of several different traits. The, all of the traits are meristic counts, Two of them are vertebral counts. And here I'm showing you data from a garter snake population that I studied. And I'm showing, um, this is a sample of, I can't remember, seven, 800 newborn offspring. And I'm showing you the distribution of body vertebral count. It might not be quite perfectly normal, but it's certainly continuous and, unimor and unimodal, right? And uh, you can count the number of vertebrae. You can do x-rays, but, but uh, conveniently, uh, on the underside of the snake are, are belly scales that line up one for one with the body vertebrae. And then posterior to the, the vent, the anal opening, cloacal opening, uh, there's another set of scales, and they give us a one-to-one -one count, one-to-one -one relationship, and hence a count of the number of vertebrae in the, in the, in the tail. Also, uh, pregnant garter snakes and water snakes have this little device in their body which gives investigators uh, a random variable that's very highly correlated with their body temperature. Wonderful. You're, yeah, this is my perverse kind of humor. It helps keep you awake, right? All right, so if we do the actual plots then, take the body count for mom, and I am going to worry about sexual dimorph dimorphism, so I'm just going to take the body vertebral count for daughters, and this is a sample of uh, 104, I think 102, 104 uh, families. And, and the slope of the line, because we've got one average, of, average mid offspring plotted against one parent, the slope of the line estimates half the heritability of the trait, if you think through the algebra. And if we double that value, the slope of this line is, what is that, uh, 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 0.27? And if we do the same, same thing for tail vertebral counts, there's a slightly lower heritability. Now, what we're going to do in our, our 
computer exercise is we're, I'm going to give you this data and we're going to do a very simple exercise. Uh, we're going to uh, estimate the heritability of these traits and some other meristic counts, number of head counts on, on, the, on the body. It would be incredibly boring, but for two things. We're going to give you a script that actually shows how to do these calculations. And how many of you have written functions in R, your own personal private functions? How many of you have not? There are a few of you, right? So the, the exercise this afternoon, after lunch, will show you an example of writing functions. And the functions that we're going to write is a function that bootstraps the, the sampling distribution of this slope. And if that wasn't wonderful enough, it's also going to do an animation because it's a, as a, a kind of crude animation because we're going we're gonna to plot the, the bootstrap values on the original plot and you're going to see, you're gonna see the, you know, the, the slope jiggle like this. And of course, if we were estimating without error, our, our line would be like this. But our sample is finite and so it's going gonna, it's gonna to do that. But it, you'll get a visual sense of how, um, how good our estimate is. And I love these visual things. Uh, so I'm also going to do that, should give you an example later on in the course where we do this kind of visualization by bootstrapping with, um, with uh, selection surfaces too. But anyway, so, that'll be, so we'll come back to these data. You'll see them, but with, with bootstrapped estimates of the, uh, the slope. Okay, so more broadly, uh, if we look across the literature on, on morphological traits, what we see in the literature, this is data from Tim Asso and Derek Roth, if you look at a large sample of almost 600 studies, you can see that there's a lot of spread, but there's also a modal tendency for morphological traits to have a heritability of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, something like that. Why do we care about this survey? Suppose we want to model the evolution of the average trait in evolutionary time, what value of heritability would we use? You could do worse than taking the modal or average value from this big survey, and if you want to look at sampling variation, intertaxonomic variation about that average, you could use, you could use, th so this survey is very useful to us. Helps. And, Another curious thing is you'll notice that sometimes we get negative estimates and estimates bigger than one for heritability, which is impossible for a slope, but it can happen just by sampling, sampling errors. The parameter does not vary uh, above, ab below zero with Mendelian inheritance, and it doesn't vary above, uh, above uh, uh, let's see, I guess it does vary above one, doesn't it? No, no, it doesn't because it can't. It can't. So you you get tails of the tails of the distribution that are just sort of sampling accidents. Joe wants to comment. You get various methods can give you a heritability estimate greater than one. Um, generally, when you do things like maximum likelihood estimates of heritability, they 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 force you to be in the range yeah. of zero to one. Uh, they can even, you can even, as, you, as you've shown there, uh, you can get estimates that are negative also. Yeah, yeah, not very many, but a few. Yeah, and again, um, if you were estimating by maximum likelihood, those wouldn't occur either. This survey is over uh, the entire literature uh, for the last, what, I don't know, 70 years. So many of the earlier estimates are, are not by maximum likelihood. They're, they're simple regression estimates. Am I talking loud enough? Do I mumble when I... Okay. Okay, here we're to our, our next to last topic. Why don't we run out of additive genetic variants? And this is a, this is a flow chart uh, based on a model, a sort of a verbal model, uh, which gets expressed in algebra in various ways by Russ Landy. But if, so the idea is, <coughs> we think for a variety of reasons that the average trait in the average population is probably under stabilizing selection, and the mean that we observe generally speaking, is fairly close to the optimum. Just as a, a default model, that's, that's a commonly accepted one. So if you think about what might, what might 
the fate of genetic variation in such an equilibrium population be, then you, you can derive a model like this in which you imagine that each generation there's an input to the variation that's expressed in your, verte your vertebral numbers, for example, from mutation. There's a loss each generation by stabilizing selection, as Jay Lush liked to say, stabilizing selection or directional selection is going to nibble away at this. Uh, there's hidden variation in the sense that you can have negatively linked combinations of alleles. So you have an individual that's got a value of zero for uh, you know, the, the average population mean value for the vertebral count. That might mean that it just happens to have alleles that make zero contribution to deviation from the mean. But there would be other individuals that would have some negative contributions, at, uh, some loci, positive uh, contributions at the others, and those would cancel out. So the differences between the individuals would be hidden. And if you think about variation in general, so there's, there's hidden variation in the population, which is, uh, which is in linkage disequilibrium being destroyed by recombination and being recreated by selection each generation. So this is the standard, you know, uh, yin and yang of, of linkage disequilibrium. Okay, so... Generally speaking, if you try to account for the amount of genetic variation we observe in populations, you come up a little short with this model, just this model. But if you add in migration uh, from other populations so that you've got new alleles coming into the population, probably at a, at a much greater rate than mutation, and maybe you add in drift so that you've got finite population size and you're losing genetic variation. A, a general model like this, I think, probably could, you know, I don't know that anyone's actually fit the entire model to a natural population, but that's, this is sort of a, the current idea on why expressed variation in the population tends to have a modal value of 0.4 when we look at it as a heritability, uh, and that this argument also implies that we might reach an equilibrium under mutation, migration, recombination, stabilizing selection, and drift, so that values might be constant, relatively constant, from generation to generation. And that is the core of the Landy view of quantitative, evolutionary quantitative genetics. The quantitative genetic parameters that we're interested in, genetic variances and covariances, might equilibrate and might plausibly be constant or relatively constant on, on an evolutionary time scale, particularly if the pattern of selection is, is stable. And there's some evidence that that's true, which uh, I guess we'll go into. Do you go into that in your talk, Adam? Maybe. All right. How am I doing on time? Do I have 10 minutes? Maybe even a little time for questions. I said I loved your questions, and I timed my lecture, so there's no time for them. Uh, there'll, there'll be a little bit of time. All right, so here's our last point in our outline. Uh, the A primary reason we're interested in additive genetic variance, uh, Galton's concept, Fisher showed, is uh, because it has a direct relationship to how traits respond not only to directional selection, but stabilizing selection as well. We're going to just talk about directional selection. And we're going to come back to, so here's the, here's the, here's the, the plot we showed before. This is a, that Joe showed before. Uh, I'm going to do it with mid-parents and offspring or average of offspring so that the slope of the regression we fit is h squared, okay, just to make things simple. And I'm going to imagine that we, we're going to perform, we're going to be breeders, and we're going to perform truncation selection, and we're going to say, where is that value? It looks like about 0 0.5. Any individual, any parent with a trait value greater than 0 0.5 is going to become an actual parent of the next generation, okay? And I've colored those in black. So black plus blue represents all the potential parents of the next generation, and then in black, we've shown the potential, the actual parents of the next generation. Okay? This is a thought experiment with simulated data. All right, so now what we, want to, what we want to see is 
if, if we, ha we let all populations, all parents breed with equal fitness, then the popu expected population mean would be right on this mean by the mean from the previous generation by Hardy-Weinberg random mating and our other arguments, right? If, if a subset, a truncated subset of the, actual, the potential parents become the actual parents, their offspring, by the argument Joe gave earlier, will be somewhere up here. So the change from here to here will be the change across generations in the trait we're interested in, right? This set of offspring are in one generation. This set of offspring are in the next generation. And so I'm doing a little sleight of hand, but it's not too bad. Let's do it, let's do it graphically this way. And actually, I've, done it, I've screwed it up a little bit graphically because this point should be exactly there. We're expecting the offspring to be exactly the same as the parent. So there's a little sampling variation here. Uh, but the subset of selected parents are going to have an average, an offspring average here right on the regression line corresponding to that, the average of the actual parents. And here is going to be the expected trait value for their offspring. So this change, so we're going to call this Z bar, the mean in one generation. And here, Z bar star, that's going to be we're going to symbolize the mean of the parents that uh, are selected. And here they survive truncation selection. You with me? So if we take all parents, this is what the mean would be without selection. And then this offspring mean is the offspring mean that we will get under selection. And in that sense, we've made a transition from one generation to the next. And our symbol is going to be for that delta z bar, the change in the average trait value. And so we're going to write our equation this way. The change in the trait value across generations is going to be g. Remember, h squared times s, we could write it that way. But we've also shown that h squared is equal to g times the inverse of p, g over, there it is. Oh, well, it used to be over there. Am I doing this too fast? I'm trying to speed up so there's time for a few questions. You want, you want to, are you scratching? Yeah, you are. <coughs> okay, so now let's talk about, so this is great for truncation selection, but it's also the case that we can show this, that this S works regardless of what, what form of selection we impose. So if we, you could, as Joe said, you could have a sort of weird combination <coughs> of, of uh, what did I do with my water here? I hit it for myself. You can have a sort of weird combination of, of parents that survive selection, right? Still, you would take the, their phenotypic average, wherever it happens to be, you go up to the regression line, and you will, you will, you will well, you'll calculate, you'll calculate S, and call, that's going to be the, their mean after, the mean of parents after selection. You go up to the line, and you will get the correct offspring value after selection of those selected parents. And uh, we'll talk about why that's true. It actually comes down to the fact that this S is a covariance between trait values and fitness, relative fitness, that makes that result. So this is completely general. It works for truncation selection. It'll work for any form of selection. And it enables us to translate selection in this generation into a change in the trait value in the next generation. So here's another phrase from Jay Lush. What Jay Lush said is, Heritability is the fraction of the selection differential that's translated into the next generation. Here you can see it. Heritability is the fraction, remember it varies between 0 and 1, the fraction of S that becomes the change in means across generation. A nice way of thinking about it, and it probably saved many of his students on exams in his course. Um, all right, so what happens if we, if we do something outrageous, do a thought experiment in which we select, we hold the heritability estimate constant, and we, we impose 
uh, the same directional selection each generation. We just keep marching out, right? The new means here, we're going to take that much selection beyond it. And if we do that, what we will do is, as Steve Gould called it, that we'll get a march of the frequency distribution, and here in white I've shown the change in the mean over 400 generations under the simple model. And if we had a very large population, and we did the experiment, that's exactly what, what we should observe. But if we have selected populations that are exposed to selection that ha are finite in size, say 500, then we will get spread about this line due to drift, because now the population is exposed to two forces. There's sampling of parents each generation, right? Because we're only taking a subset of 500 to start each, we're, we're regulating to a size of 500, effective size of 500, in, and we're also imposing directional selection. And so we'll get, we'll get a result like this. I've shown you the 99% confidence limits about our expectation, and you can see they grow through time. So I'm, I'm taking the time to do this because it's very common to think of, of selection and drift as two separate things. And of course they are, but they're in, when we model, they're very easily combined into the same model. And I'll actually show you, the, we'll show you the R script for, that generated this, this plot. If we pull away, make the selection differential zero, this whole plot will be ro rotated down like this, and we will have a model for pure drift in the population. And here I've just added drift and, and directional selection. Okay, and uh, oh, and there's an animation, uh, which I can't click on because I've already eaten up my time. Okay, so here are examples of changing trait means with simple truncation selection in laboratory populations. These are abdominal and sternobristle, sterno, sternopleural bristle numbers in Drosophila. These are Trudy McKay's experiments. And here's a summary. I've got to wrap up quickly because I've even eaten up the question time unless we go into the break. What have we learned? We've tried to argue and convince you that additive genetic variance is the key to understanding the resemblance between parents and offspring. Uh, and because that relationship is so key to modeling the response to directional, directional selection, G is also the, the key to understanding how the effects of selection gets, get trans, translated in the next generation. Um, we can worry about G being nibbled away by selection of various kinds, but we're, it's likely that, that the observation of of standing genetic variation in most populations that we look at, even with snapshots, that, that picture of snapshots showing that there's genetic variation for most traits is likely due to the fact that the effects of selection on genetic variants are being restored each generation by processes of mutation and probably also migration. So uh, that's why we get a, a distribution of heritabilities that's not at all close to zero. It's out in pretty substantial, in, you know, about in the, the mid part of the parameter range. Here are some references, uh, some of them the same as Joe. And I guess that's it. So by the schedule, I've succeeded in nibbling away at all available time. So, uh, huh. who wrote up this schedule? Oh, I see. Yeah, it is. It, it's, our discussion should have gone from 11.15 to right now. We've got um, um, 12.45. You want to take, sh shall we eat up a little bit of our lunch hour, which is generous? I, I suggest we take at least 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, okay. I'm, that's where I'm headed, too. So for lunch, I, I guess we, if you, in case you didn't know, we're going to take, we're gonna just going to go downstairs. So, you know, there'll be sandwiches or something, and we can come back up. So uh, let's go till noon, uh, and that'll still give us uh, an hour and 15 minutes for lunch. Okay, and uh, usual rules apply. Uh, uh, Gary? Is that your name? Yeah. Oh, you're Juan. Okay, sorry. You need a, a microphone. Tried to learn your name. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> iterate. I'm iterate. Are you Felipe? Yeah, so, Felipe. yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so um, in, the, in the scenario of a truncation selection, S is a number, right? So is it... Oh, you mean the, 
the selection differential that we attach to that truncation. Yeah, event. I mean, it's yeah. one value, right? So is it correct to just um, plug a distribution or a selection surface in in, term, in, the, in the scenario of a natural um, selection scenario? Um, you know what? I'm, can I defer that till later? Because we're going to spend a whole lecture on selection and then a whole lecture on surfaces. OK. So uh, I think the answer is yes, but it's going to take a couple lectures to convince you, I think. All right, thanks. OK, <laughs> does that help? Yeah, in the back. Um, so um, if you could come back to slide seven. Slide seven, OK, here we go. Tell me when we're there. Oh, yeah, that one. That one? <coughs> How could I guess? Uh, <laughs> so I was wondering about um, the epistasis, um, because we have this um, R squared and the progressive powers of, of R attached right. to the epistasis variance. But that's all, um, I think, under um, the assumption that um, we have no linkage, right? Uh, because if we have epistasis between uh, the genes that are on the same chromosome and uh, they're closely linked, then um, the coefficient will be higher, I think, right? And it can yeah. be much higher because you will have higher probability of inheriting um, uh -huh. the same allele in, in both. So I have the advantage of having an expert here in the room. So the the uh, the timid thing to do would be to defer to Joe immediately. But I we might learn more if I try and answer your question, and then and then Joe will answer your cor correction your question while correcting me. Let me. So <laughs> I'm guessing that it's not linkage that's so much a problem as linkage disequilibrium. And I think we've. I think we, we're not arguing that there's no linkage, but we did make an assumption way back in Joe's lecture that we had no linkage disequilibrium between loci. And now Joe will give you a, m a more informed answer. Mm -hmm. I'll be corrected by Patrick. I believe, I believe that the things like R squared for the AA component um, is, you know, is done under the assumption of no linkage, not no linkage disequilibrium, and that the uh -huh. Correct term would be something like uh, if they're two loci uh, fraction recombination fraction c apart, right. it would be something like a half times one minus c. Yeah, Patrick is, that right? Patrick is more more official on this, and he he is saying yes. Okay, so, so it so is. I claim linkage, not linkage disequilibrium. You what? I claim that that these are derived under the assumption of no linkage. Oh, uh, as well as no linkage. As well it? as uh, no, and I don't. Yeah. Uh, okay, so oh, yeah? you, you okay. can, it uh, probably gets even more complicated when you do, yeah. Do you want to weigh in as well, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so you, a you ask fact, a good question. It's a great question, but the, the, um, <laughs> the fact <laughs> is, if you knew where everything, where all these loci were in the genome, you could put the correct factors in. But when you're estimating things, you generally don't know what loci are involved or where they are, so you actually can't can't use all that in that way. Exactly. So okay. So so the reason I was wondering um, that is, let's say I do a heritability estimation from parent offspring regression or from like one generation, one or two generation breeding design. So parent offspring or or half half seeps, and then I I actually have no way of knowing how much of my um, heritability or how much of my additive variance estimation is actually the the epistatic variation between fairly closely linked alleles, right? So I'd have to I don't know continue that for a number of generation and generations to see how it how it changes or something to. That I think may, maybe Patrick should answer that. I don't know. Did you? you know. So could you s say the? Uh, I was just wondering what happens when I I'm trying to estimate 
the additive genetic variation in a trait mm -hmm. and, and doing a parent offspring regression or, or half sib design. Um, because uh, I have no way of, of inferring if I don't. Um, so I, I have no way of knowing how much of what I estimate as additive genetic variation is actually epistatic uh, variation. Right. In Th and that's usually the case. Okay. Okay. Um, and so the be I mean, the best way to handle that is with, um, well, there, it, it's actually very difficult to partition out the epistasis. And so you generally have to assume that it's, it's zero unless you've set up a specific experiment to, to measure what the what the amount of epistasis is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, unfortunately it's one of those it's one of those big assumptions that that you have to make um with the usual sorts of breeding designs um is that the ep the epistasis is is zero. Okay. okay. So you want to look on the bright side for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> so what we're saying then is by our argument this the slope here is not pure additive genetic variance right, by our, by our algebra. There's a little bit of contamination and we don't know the magnitude by epistatic variance. Now, the one piece of good news is it only comes from additive by additive interactions. It's not all epistasis, just that one kind. But nevertheless, there's a, there's a contamination here. But if we're interested in response to selection, we want this slope anyway, not the, right, that's the parent offspring slope. And so, you know, if we could estimate additive genetic variance in its purest form, to actually make our evolutionary prediction, we'd need to add back in the appropriate, you see what I'm saying? So by, by just a, like a fluke, Galton stumbled onto the precisely the regression line we need for evolutionary inferences. So, so that's part of the reason why in the literature nobody's fussing about this much. I mean, there, you'll find some fussing, but it's not, a, it's not viewed as a serious problem. So you're not going to have, if you estimate, if you estimate uh, additive genetic variance by parent-offspring regression and then use that estimate to make an evolutionary prediction in the univariate case or the multivariate case, I don't think you're going to encounter a reviewer who's going to have a problem with that. Because everybody... Because if everybody worried about that, we couldn't do anything, right? So it's one of those, it's what I call one of those scientific conspiracies that you, you, you buy into and, you know, we all, we all agree. It's not a problem, you know, we won't, we won't ding on each other, you know. So that's, that's the way it is. Joe's rolling his eyes here, but. I just have a question about, um, so so far when we've been talking about genetic effects, it's, it's in this kind of statistical framework in which, you know, it's, it's the regression effects, basically, an interaction yeah. among yeah. regression terms. Um, but that's not, I think, how a lot of us are introduced to the concept of a genetic effect. You know, a lot of us hear about genetic effects as being knockdown mutations or something. Right, or, right. or that we talk about epistasis in terms of, like, dog coat color or something. So they don't, they don't have this statistical framework for a lot of us. And so I, I guess I was just wondering if you could comment on kind of the disconnect between definitions of, of genetic effects and how... So, yeah. So, there, so Adam will probably do a better job. But again, I will take a stab since I'm up here and you ask me. So there's... What we're talking about in these models is, is statistical epistasis. You know, the interaction, the coefficients that you attach to interactions between effects at different loci. Uh, what you're talking about in, you know, when, if you're in a QTL lab, you're talking, or in a, your, a physio physiological genetics lab, you're talking about functional epistasis. You're acting, asking, and, and the, quite, the issues are different. You're interested in whether there's an interactive effect between loci as it affects the expression of the phenotype. So your concerns are different than someone who wants to make predictions about response to selection in the barnyard or field or in an evolution in a natural population undergoing evolutionary process. And so for that second second situation, uh, it's sufficient to use the statistical characterization of epistasis. And that leads to an argument that the effects probably aren't very big. And in any case, they're distor they, you know, they're, 
we still should be using the parent on offspring regression to make our evolutionary predictions. So the two, the two spheres coexist, but I've got, this is what I was alluding to before. The functional epistasis argument does bleed into the evolutionary literature because there's a set of evolutionary biologists who will argue that, you know, the epistasis is so common, functional epistasis is so common, it seems unlikely that we can just ignore it in all evolutionary situations. And the other group, based on statistics, says, you know, the argument, you know, the, the fact is we've been ignoring it for years, and these, you know, the, the, the predictions that we make are pretty accurate. So, you know, it, it, it's unlikely that we really need to build it into our models. So, uh, but there is a controversy there, and people are trying to look, look for ways of, of arguing and, you know, uh, arguing between those two. And, and in fact, it's Adam and me who have a, with a uh, colleague who have a proposal in the works to get a f project funded to try and answer it, or at least address that. Con you have something to say. I, I do. I, I want to address that um, question by the other Patrick in the room uh, uh, in, a, in a broader context, because the way I interpreted your question was, we think we've been trained to think about genetics in a poli in a particular way from a molecular standpoint and here we're we're talking we're not talking that same language and so one way to think about that is think about the QTL and QTN studies that you know about if you were to find a QTL that explains say 15% of the variation in a phenotype you'd wet your pants with excitement right wow i can explain 15% with this one locus well what about the other 85% it's many gene, it's many loci of very small effect. That's the world we're dealing with here. The only way to, to the, the set of tools we have to understand um, that amount of variation that can't be explained by genes of major effect are these statistical um, approaches. And I think the fact that, um, that you feel that this disconnect is a failure of our basic genetic classes. Um, if you think about the genetics course you took as a, a sophomore or junior in college, I bet you spent at most one day on quantitative genetics in that class, and otherwise you were learning about Western blots and all kinds of like technical details, right? Well, I mean, you learned important molecular things as well. So I, I think as a, um, uh, as biologists, we do our students a huge disservice by not spending more time in our basic genetic classes talking about um, quantitative genetics and the fact that it is a tool to explain the variation that we cannot measure due to um, you know one or two uh, two major two major loci. Um, but remember, this is a very old branch of, of genetics, the tools have become very sophisticated, um, and it's, it's a way to get a handle on the underpinning, underpinnings of genetic variations in, situ in situations where you cannot find any genes of, of major effect to, to explain it. Right, and so that's why we're, we're, not, we're not pushing epistasis aside, we're trying to show you that, yeah, so, so good, another good question. I wanted to, just since you bring it up, we're bring, you brought up the fact of polygeny. When I was showing you this, this plot of human stature, I meant to allude to Peter Fisher's group's results, which doing the, the most recent analysis, uh, when I looked at the literature about a year ago, the last time we taught this course, I think it was 180, um, about 180 loci affecting human stature. And I heard that the estimate is now up to, is it up to 700 or something like that? Anyway, so, so I, there's sort of a random... I mean, the heritability is about, you know, 75% or something like a little higher in this particular plot. But, but that's a lot of genes. And it's, it's, it's a little difficult to believe that it, this is an exceptional case. So we used to say, oh, you know, there could be dozens, scores of genes affecting the average trait. Well, the reality might be for most continuously varying traits, it actually could be hundreds of loci. So, uh, you know, the epistatic contributions, you know, if you're, it, again, it depends on the trait, though. If you're looking at, if you're looking at coat color in mice, uh, it very well could be a, a relatively simple Mendelian trait, and epistasis would have a completely different role than it would be, have for human stature. So you, well, it's one of our lessons is you have to think about the trait that you're looking at and its, its genetic basis, and it, it varies hugely from trait. We're talking about continuously distributed rather than discrete category, you know, color polymorphisms or something like that.